Hello and welcome to another video from the only channel you need to not only survive the current apocalypse but actually enjoy it. And today's video is about time as it applies to the Bible. The Bible's tracking of time seems to be a big issue now, especially as more and more people are waking up to the fact that this here so-called civilization seems to be nearing its end. But another topic that involves time that has come up in our modern scientific era is the age of the earth. I have been asked my opinion on the age of the earth several times on my channel and I've always avoided taking any kind of stand. I usually try to avoid making any statements that will cause bad feelings unless I have something to say that is important to the understanding of Bible basics. Although the age of the earth does relate to everything else in the Bible in some fashion, as far as I can tell, knowing the age of the earth is not as key to Bible understanding as most of the other subjects that I make videos about. But for many people, this is a make or break issue. If I take a stand on this issue, many of my subscribers are going to lose confidence in me, irregardless of what my opinion is. About a third of all people believe that the earth is very young, another third believe that the earth is very old, and the remaining third believe something else. I hope that everyone understands that although I have an opinion about this subject, there was really no way that I was going to say what that opinion was about without also being allowed to say why. One of the problems that we have as a people is our desire to quantify everything, and that's okay, because our God designed us in such a way as to be curious, which means that we want to understand the world around us. At one time, that curiosity would have been easy to satisfy, because Yahweh was speaking to us in a way that he no longer speaks to us today. In other words, we could simply go to him and say, Father, how old is the earth? And he would answer in such a way that no further research would be required on our part. Thousands of years ago, our father did tell people exactly how long creation took, and at least one of those people recorded it in the Bible, so that we today wouldn't have to ask him personally. Because of the way that civilization is set up, there is always going to be conflict. Soon that will no longer be the case. We are trained from infancy to think of science and spiritualities as enemies of one another, and in fact Satan's version of science is in conflict with his version of spirituality. But Jehovah's version of science, which would be true science, is in perfect harmony with true spirituality. If someone that made his living as a scientist or as a science teacher was to make the statement that the earth was 6,000 years old, there is a very strong possibility that he or she would be fired, whether they could prove their claim or not. And such a person would probably not be able to locate employment in their chosen field. The same could be said of a professional theologian that chooses to take a stand that the earth is 4.5 billion years old although that, for the most part, is not quite as much of an issue as it would have been in the past. There is evidence that seems to support the 6,000-year theory, as well as evidence that seems to support the 4.5 billion-year theory, but both theories are problematic. The 4.5 billion year old Earth theory is based on the fact that we humans have ways of observing the natural processes taking place in the world around us that seem to never change, and by using straight line reasoning we can follow such processes all the way back to their beginnings. In other words, new stuff is not the same as old stuff. We have ways of precisely measuring the physical characteristics that differentiate new stuff from old stuff, and we have supposedly come up with ways to determine just how long it takes for new stuff to turn into old stuff. The most significant problem with that particular belief system is that it fails to take into consideration that the Creator is called the Creator because He has the ability to create. Not because he has the ability to create new stuff, but because he has the ability to create any kind of stuff that he wants to create. Including stuff that has the physical characteristics that scientists say can only exist in old stuff. If the Bible had originally been written in English and said in no uncertain terms that the earth was created in six days and that those days were in fact 24 hours long or that those days were governed by the rotation of the earth or even that those days were governed by the speed of light or the rate of radioactive decay, then spiritually or scripturally there would be no reason to question the amount of time taken by our God to create the earth. 
In this particular instance, the problem isn't so much what the Bible says as how we perceive what is said. The Bible is very precise when it comes to the measure of time. Time plays a big part in many of the prophecies regarding our future. And so accurate records of many Bible events are essential to our being able to understand not just what is about to befall the earth, but when. Many Bible prophecies have already been fulfilled. Seeing how those past prophecies worked out exactly on schedule is an important part of our faith. There are quite a few words that the Bible uses to describe time that can only be taken one way, such as a year. A year in the Bible is always the amount of time that the earth takes to orbit the sun, but the Bible does not hide the fact that the length of time necessary for the earth to complete its orbit is not a constant. In the very beginning of the Bible, a year was obviously 360 days long, which means that our planet must have slowed down at some point, because during our lifetime, the length of the year has always been a little over 365 days. The scriptures that speak of a 360 day year are not figurative. They are not part of some spiritual calendar used to keep track of events in the spirit realm and are not a mistake made by primitive Iron Age man. In the Bible book of Genesis, Abraham was told by God that he would multiply his offspring until they were as the stars of the heavens in number, but that his offspring would be enslaved to a 400 year cycle. Hundreds of years later, while being executed, Stephen affirmed that mankind would be enslaved to the 400 year cycle. In the time of Abraham, every calendar on the earth was based on a 400 year cycle of 144,000 days. But in the time of Stephen, the earth was governed by a 400 year cycle of 146,097 days. Our modern Gregorian calendar is also based on a 400 year repeating cycle of 146,097 days. Due to the difference in years, as recorded by many people across many cultures, there is a struggle within some religions over the concept of a religious calendar versus a real calendar. But the Bible never makes reference to any kind of religious calendar. When the Bible speaks of years, it isn't speaking of any particular number of days, but of the actual time that the earth took to orbit the sun, whether it was 360 days, as it was in the ancient past, or 365 days, as it has been for about 2,700 years. The 360-day year was once a reality, just as the 365 and a quarter day year is today. There can be no doubt that back in the beginning of human history, the earth that we live on actually rotated 360 times every time that it made a complete orbit around the sun. Cultures all around our planet, from the Middle East to Central America, have left stone calendars testifying to a time when our planet was governed by a 400-year cycle of 360-day years. The Jews had a 360-day calendar, the Egyptians had a 360-day calendar, and the Mayans had a 360-day calendar. The diversity of cultures and religions around our globe that shared a 400-year, 360-day calendar proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the 360-day calendar was not a religious calendar, but an actual representation of how our solar system worked at one time. For anyone wishing to get a deeper understanding of this basic Bible teaching, I made an entire video series explaining why the Earth went from a 360 day year to 365 called Written in Stone. Scientists use physical constants as standards when measuring such things as time. A physical constant would be anything that science considers to be unchangeable, such as rates of radioactive decay or the speed of light. But even these things fall under the Creator's jurisdiction. Since our Father is the only truly unchangeable thing in our universe, the only precise measure of time would have to depend on Him. We as fleshly human creatures are limited in our ability to comprehend time by what we can observe with our senses. 
for a natural man living under God's natural law, watching the sunset would be all that would be needed in order to observe the passing of the unit of time that the Bible refers to as one day. But due to original sin, many people consider themselves to be gods, and as such, attempt to make it appear as if they are somehow above natural law. Those at the top of the unnatural hierarchical pyramid of civilization keep track of time by using costly, resource-destroying machines that require skilled laborers to observe the phenomenon of radioactive decay. Presently, if both ways are equally valid in observing the passing of time, but radioactive decay, just like the setting of the sun, is still a naturally occurring phenomenon which only exists because our Creator put it there. Most people that have looked into the Bible for information about the age of the earth have only read the creation account as found in Genesis and only in its English form. But there is much more recorded in the Bible that is every bit as important as what is recorded in the creation account and much of the information recorded outside of Genesis is even more important to determining the age of the earth than what is recorded in the creation account itself. Some of what I'm going to talk about is part of an ongoing argument between the two camps in this dispute. If this issue is important to you, you probably have already heard much of what I'm going to say, but I promise that there will be a great deal of information that you have never heard before. We are living in a time that has been spoken of for thousands of years. The amount of knowledge that is reaching those of us that truly love Yahweh is unprecedented in human history, and it appears as if the Creator of the universe has taken a special interest in those of us that have found one another using this channel. I do not make such claims lightly. Very early in world history, God created light and dark, and at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5 it says that the dark he called night, while the light he called day. This event took place on day one of creation. Just by using simple reasoning, it is quite obvious that the scripture is specifically saying that the length of time that it took for God to create light and dark was measured as one complete rotation of the earth. But in verses 14 through 19, God went on to create what most people accept as being the sun and the moon. This event did not take place until the fourth day. That being the case, the cycle of light and dark were very obviously not dictated by the setting and rising of what we today would recognize as our sun, since up until the fourth day there would have been no sun. In other words, whether or not the Earth's rotations were similar in length to the rotations of the Earth in our day, there would have been no sun or moon to act as luminaries to mark the passing of those rotations. But that isn't the only problem. Since man wasn't created until the sixth day, there wouldn't have been anyone available to observe the luminaries of the heavens anyway. But as we're about to find out, this isn't as much of a problem as we might think. The word that we translate as day is yaum. I am totally satisfied with the use of our English word day in many instances where this word occurs in our Bible, particularly since we often use the word day in English to describe things other than a 24-hour cycle of time. If all English Bibles consistently used the word day everywhere that the word yaum appeared in the original Hebrew text, we would have no problem saying that the word yaum is the same as our word for a 24-hour day. Unfortunately, that is not at all how this is handled. Just as an example, the online version of Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the King James Translation of the Bible says that the word yaum is translated about 271 times as words other than our English word day. The time that I have spent looking into these alternate translations of the word make it appear that most, if not all, of these instances can easily be resolved without changing our understanding of the questionable verses. Just as one example, Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25 uses the word yaum when it says that during Peleg's day the earth became divided. Some Bibles render this verse by saying during Peleg's time or lifetime. If these renderings are correct, then the length of Peleg's day would not be equal to the time that the earth takes to make one rotation. Peleg's lifetime was certainly longer than 24 hours. But by tradition, many versions of the Bible actually translate this verse to say that during Peleg's days, plural, 
the earth became divided. This rendering would preserve the original idea that is presented in the scripture while also preserving the concept of a day always being one rotation of the earth. Genesis chapter 26 and verse 8 is another example. Here we see the word yam used along with the word arak and incorporated into what appears to be an idiomatic phrase from the era which ends up being translated as a long time. I think that the word arak could be translated as passing, which would make the idiomatic phrase mean the passing of days. Once again, this is a very reasonable grammatical solution, preserving the idea of a day being one rotation of the earth. I haven't attempted to resolve every problematic passage using the word yaum, but I am reasonably sure that every use of this word is based on the amount of time necessary for the earth to complete one rotation. Since God created the luminaries of the heavens as a way for humans to perceive the passing of time, I have no doubt that since the creation of the first man, Adam, every single day has been associated with one rotation of the earth. And there really isn't any reason to question whether or not this was the case before Adam's creation. Yahweh is referred to in the Bible as the Creator. One of the things that He created is our solar system. Even though our solar system is made up of many things, including the sun, the planets, and the moons, it has to be acknowledged that all of those objects are just small parts of our much larger solar system. The center of our solar system is a star that we call the sun, and every other object in our solar system moves in predictable patterns relative to that star. Those celestial objects themselves are made up of even smaller objects known as atoms. And according to what we refer to as modern science, those atoms are themselves made up of even smaller particles. Supposedly, those subatomic particles that make up an atom, like the objects that make up our solar system, also follow very predictable patterns. Science tells us that these patterns are unchangeable. Using these supposedly observable patterns, scientists have declared our Earth to be 4.5 billion years old. There isn't any actual way to prove or disprove their theories because subatomic particles are so small that to date no one has ever been able to create an instrument powerful enough to observe them. The scientific community claims that they don't need to observe the actual particles themselves because they have powerful instruments that can observe the effects that those particles produce. There is very little chance that any of us will ever even see such a machine in real life because such instruments are so expensive that only the empire's multinational corporate entities could ever hope to possess such devices. And only high-ranking members of the evolutionist faith have any chance whatsoever of being hired to operate them. Our inability to purchase billion dollar machines does not mean that we simply have to accept that what we are being told is true by those that claim to be above natural law. Just the simple act of observing the setting of the sun is efficient to prove the claims of science to be in error. The same religion of science that claims to have proven that the earth is 4.5 billion years old also claims that the earth's orbital cycle around our sun takes 365.2 five six three six three zero zero four days to complete this is also how long the earth year was when the gregorian calendar was developed over 400 years ago according to science that is because the earth's orbital cycle has been stable for millions of years Every advanced civilization of the ancient world left archaeological evidence that less than 3,000 years ago, the Earth was governed by a 400-year solstice cycle made up of 360-day years, themselves made up of 1230-day months. If the ancient world was actually governed by a 365-day year, similar to our modern year, someone living at the time would have had to have noticed. The fact that these cultures all came to the conclusion that the year was 360 days long, supposedly independently of one another, would basically qualify as eyewitness testimony from every human that has ever lived. That the length of our natural year really did go 
from 360 days to 365 and a quarter days less than 3,000 years ago. Not only does the religion of science not understand how this happened, but in fact refuse to even acknowledge that it did happen. If scientists don't even have the ability to explain the very easy to observe patterns followed by the massive objects in our solar system, it would be foolish to imagine that they could somehow explain the patterns that are followed by subatomic particles that they themselves cannot even observe. Also, knowing that God has the ability to alter the patterns followed by the most massive objects in our solar system, it would be foolish to attempt to use science to come up with some reasoning as to why he would not be able to do something similar with the minute particles that he used to make those objects. The religions of the world have been making rules about God for thousands of years, and billions of people have been fooled into believing in those rules. The rules that have been created by the religion of science are only superficially different from those of the empire's other religions. The Bible does say that to God a thousand years is like a day, and this word day is translated from the Greek word hamera, which is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word yaum. In fact, a more accurate translation of this verse would be, Beloved, do, to, do not allow this thing to be hidden from you. One of God's days is equal to 1,000 years. According to the Bible, our human day is 24 hours long because our observance of this cycle of time is governed by the setting of the sun. The Bible does not specify any observable phenomenon associated with God's day, which is equal to one of our millenniums. But after the resurrection, I am certain that God will reestablish whatever observable event originally marked off the passing of God's yawm of a thousand years. Peter's choice of words in this verse cannot simply mean that a thousand years goes by very quickly for God because he is very old. Ancient Hebrew culture is not the same as modern English culture. That doesn't mean that we can't get a clear understanding of time as it is recorded in the Bible. Their Shabuim is a cycle of seven, but unlike our week, which is a cycle of seven days, a Shabuim can be a cycle of seven days weeks, years, annual Sabbaths, or millenniums. For us, a day is the amount of time that it takes for our Earth to make a complete rotation on its axis. For Jehovah, a day is equal to a thousand Earth years. In the past, a year was exactly 360 days long, and in the very near future, our year will be restored to that state. The churches like to use what may be confusing to us as a weapon against us in order to control our thinking. But if we understand just these few small differences, they can't manipulate our perception of time. One example of how we can easily be confused by the churches if we let them is the account of when the Israelites refused to enter the promised land after spying it out for 40 days. God made them wander for 40 years before allowing them another opportunity to enter. His reasoning was that they would have to wander one year as punishment for each day, single day, that they spied it out. Using this verse, the churches often twist Bible prophecies by substituting days for years and years for days. There is nothing in the Bible that even remotely indicates that this should be done. Days and years are never interchangeable in the Bible. If the Bible says that the earth was created in six yaum, then the only options that we have are six human yaum, which would be six days, or six of God's yaum, which would be 6,000 years. Since the Bible was written for man, it is only reasonable that the days of the creation account would be similar to our 24-hour days. Otherwise, I am reasonably certain that the Bible would have in some way specified that the yaum were not man's yaum, but God's yaum. Choosing to believe that the earth was created in 6,000 years will not support a more scientific version of creation because neither length of time comes close to the supposedly proven scientific fact that the earth is 4.5 billion years old. 4.5 billion years is 750,000 times longer than 6,000 years. Understanding that there exists in our universe a living being powerful enough to create solar systems, 
leads me to believe that such a being would not be limited by the same time constraints that limit the fleshly parts of that solar system. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 9, as well as Romans chapter 9 and verse 20, both speak of how foolish it is of humans to even think that they need to know such things. In both scriptures, such people are compared to mud and pottery shards demanding an explanation from a pottery maker. Our human week follows a repeating pattern, so someone might feel that Jehovah's week also follows such a pattern. In other words, after 6,000 years of working, he took 1,000 years off, and when the first human couple sinned, he began the next 7,000 year cycle, which we are in right now. But in the Bible, it is very clear that once the final 1,000 year cycle ends, Jesus will hand over the kingdom to his Father, at which time sickness, sadness, cold, heat, rain, labor, slavery, death, crying, and everything else that is bad is done away with forever. The thousand year cycles of our solar system may continue, but there will be no more cycles of work and rest. From that point on, creation's rest will be eternal. Most of what is done as a remembrance in the Bible follows a repeating pattern. But all of those patterns are in memory of singular events or pointing forward to singular events. All of the weekly Sabbaths, yearly Sabbaths, and Jubilees are repeating patterns in remembrance of a single event. The Jews were told to follow this uh, repeating pattern as a remembrance of that singular event, but also as a constant reminder of the fact that the singular event of creation was supposed to result in rest. Every account in the Bible involving time prior to the Babylonian conquest of the Promised Land is obviously based on a 360-day year made up of 12 30-day months. If you read the Bible with an open mind and no preconceived ideas, this is quite easy to see. Modern religions try to hide this by claiming that the ancients had leap days, leap months, and leap years similar to our modern calendar. But when you read about the precision required by the Law of Moses in the keeping of the ancient Jewish rituals, there is no way that those requirements could have been met without some very clear guidelines about the insertion of those leap days, months, and years. Those added cycles of time would have been no more instinctive than they are today. For hundreds of years after the solar system went out of conjunction, nations developed their own versions of calendars, none of them alike, before the Gregorian calendar was finally developed and that was not universally accepted. Millions of lives were sacrificed in carnal warfare before the current empire was able to subject all of Earth's nations to our current system of leap cycles. If somehow you're able to read the Bible without picking up on the dramatic change in the way that the Bible records the passing of time, then probably you won't be able to understand the scriptures describing the changes that took place in the appearance of the moon either. In the beginning of time, the Bible says that our moon was always full, always in the night sky and cycling every 30 days. It is obvious that none of this is true today. I also spoke about this in my Written in Stone series. Many of the books of the Bible speak of changes in the moon, but two Bible books that clearly describe all of these changes are the book of Job and the book of Revelation. The book of Job contrary to popular belief, is not about a very patient human being, but instead about more than 7,000 years of human history as told in advance by God. Verse, verses 1 through 3 of Job, chapter 1 in our English translations of the Bible, tells us there once was a man named Job who came from the land of Uz. He was the greatest of all of the Orientals. What the Bible really says is, the forest once had a custodian whose reputation caused him to be hated, but in fact he was perfect, correct, and the greatest thing created in the Garden of Eden. I figured this out when I realized that Uz is not in the Orient. Uz simply means forest, and the word that we translate as Oriental is actually Kedem, and communicates three distinct ideas throughout the Bible. Ancient time, ancient situation, and ancient location. The name of the protagonist is actually a transliteration of the word meaning hated one. 
The description of Job's life is unique in all of the Bible. Typically, when speaking of the passing of time in a Bible character's life or the general era in which a Bible character lived, the words years and days are used. In the book of Job, these words, in a very limited way, are also used, but in quite a few instances, the passing of time as well as the general era in which events take place are associated not with days or years, but instead with months. This is an important clue into what the book of Job is actually about. At the beginning of his life, Job is spoken of as being very happy and prosperous. But as time goes on, Job is afflicted with death of family members, violence, loss of livestock, poverty, and sickness. In recounting the events of his life, Job associates the timing of those events with changes in the appearance of the moon, as well as the length of the moon's lunar cycles something that no other Bible character does. And the way that he describes the changes to the moon is similar to the way that the Bible describes the changes to the moon that have taken place not over the course of a single lifetime, but over thousands of years, not something that any one individual could have witnessed. Job speaks of a time when he lived under the beautiful moon, which would have been before the flood when the Sea of Crystal would have still been in place causing the moon to change colors 12 times over the course of the year. Then he speaks of a living under a lunar moon, which would have been from the time directly after the flood to the time of the Babylonian conquest. During that era, the moon would have been white all year long, with the exception of the first day of the seventh month during the lunar eclipse, when it would have been black, or on the last day of the twelfth month and the first day of the first month, when it would have been red, which is what we refer to as a blood moon. Then Job speaks of living under what he calls a worthless moon. The moon that we live under today, which does not follow any kind of orderly pattern, does not always appear in the night sky, and does not even stay lit, but is constantly changing from light to dark. Truly, as Job says, a worthless moon. The book of Revelation also speaks of these changes when it refers to the different moons as different colored horses. Each horse bringing with it harbingers referred to as riders, each in its turn bringing about deteriorating conditions on the earth similar to the deteriorating conditions experienced by Job. We are told that the first moon is a white horse ridden by a rider with a bow. We are led to believe that this bow is the kind of bow that an archer would use for conducting warfare, when in fact the Greek word used here means a bow made from a ribbon of colorful cloth. Even though our English word is the same for both, in Greek these two words are completely different, having nothing to do with one another. In other words, what the book of Revelation of speaking of is a white moon nearly covered by what appeared to those on earth as a bow made of colorful ribbon, what Job referred to as the beautiful moon. We are then told of a red horse and a black horse, which corresponds to what we call a blood moon and a lunar eclipse, what Job referred to as lunar months. And finally, Revelation refers to the last moon as a pale horse, which would correspond to our current moon, which cycles between light and dark. Once again, what Job refers to as a worthless moon. And remember that each of these horses or moons brings with it a rider announcing the introduction of some kind of decline in the human condition. Those same deteriorating conditions that Job experienced. Death, pestilence, famine, and warfare. Another reason why I have avoided talking about the age of the earth is because no matter how you approach it, you always end up on the emotion charge subject of the Sabbath. After all, at the end of the sixth creative day, when Jehovah was done with the creation of the earth, he saw that everything was very good and entered into what the Bible calls his rest. And it appears that that rest was supposed to last for all eternity. But that is not what happened. Satan and his angels continued to work. Those wicked angels were also able to coerce humanity into working. And the work that they did on what Jehovah himself referred to as an earth that was very good did not result in the earth becoming better, but resulted in what we have today. Most of us are familiar with the commandment, which at Genesis 28 says, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. But I don't believe that any human alive has ever actually looked into what that commandment was actually about. 
At Genesis chapter 20 and verse 11, we're told exactly what it was about. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Quite literally what is said here is that God created the earth in six yam, and on the seventh yam he rested. So according to the Ten Commandments, the Jews were to remember that the rest yam was not going to be the same as the previous work yam. Taking into consideration that God intended to rest on the seventh day, we have to ask ourselves what were his intentions for the eighth day? Did he go off to another part of the galaxy and create light and dark again? Perhaps another star with other planets? Nothing like that is recorded in the Bible. In fact, it seems that on the eighth day our Creator was still resting. Hebrews 4.3 very specifically says, Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest, and yet this, his works have been finished since the creation of the world. Those words were written about 4,000 years after Jehovah entered into his rest, and nothing else in the Bible was ever written about that rest ending. It is also clear that these verses, it is also clear from these verses that God intended for all of mankind to enter into his rest on the very day that he entered it. At this point in time, the Creator's rest has been going on for about 6,000 years. A direct, accurate translation of Hebrews chapter 4-3 drives this point home much better than any English Bible available. What Paul actually said was, because now we are being persuaded to enter into God's rest as he has promised we would, even though he himself has already been resting ever since the creation of the world. These verses should make it quite obvious that Jehovah's rest is something separate from the weekly Sabbath rest of the ancient Jews. The repeating pattern that we spoke of was highlighted by Paul when he said at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9, we are participating in a theatrical spectacle. When he said this, he was simply pointing out that the lives of Bible characters, including himself, were playing out in a seemingly choreographed fashion according to some kind of script and he was right. Historic events from the ancient past ended up being repeated over and over by one Bible character after another, as if they were all pointing towards some future climactic event, and in fact, they were. To any reasonable person that reads the Ten Commandments, it should be obvious that the commandment to rest doesn't fit in with the other commandments. Even in the most wicked empire that has ever existed, everyone pretty much understands why God would set not committing murder as a high priority. Even the commandment to not commit adultery makes sense once we realize that this word involves not just sex, but demon worship as well. But to most members of society, the crime of not resting does not really seem like much of a crime. To those that put their faith in covenant law, labor is a good thing. It's what keeps the economic system alive. It supports the political system and is itself supported by the religious system. Within civilization's domain, we are continuously reminded that good people constantly engage in some form of labor, while bad people are lazy. But to those that recognize that God intended for man to live by natural law, it is obvious that there is nothing good about the slavery-based system that we refer to as civilization. The command to remember the Sabbath is actually a command to use the seventh day yalm of man's week as a reminder of the seventh millennium yalm of Yahweh's week. In Hebrew, the word Shavuah that we translate as week actually means cycle of seven and obviously from the scriptures is not restricted to a cycle of days as our English word week. If Yahweh's yalm is a thousand years, then a Shavuah of God's yalm would equal 7,000 years. Jesus' thousand year reign as spoken of throughout the 20th chapter of Revelation would actually be the Sabbath of God's Shavuah, or what we in English would refer to as a week. In the Bible, there is a period of time referred to over and over again in one book after another as the last days. The Bible says that the last days would be a period of three and one half years made up of 360 day years for a total time period of 1,260 days. This time period would culminate with the destruction of civilization and the restoration of our solar system. 
When Jesus spoke of this period, he very specifically said at Matthew 24, 6 that nobody knows the day nor hour when the last days would begin, not even him. But every repeating pattern in the Bible points to these last days, also known as the Great Tribulation, the Great Feast Day of God Almighty, and the fear-inspiring Day of Jehovah. If all of this would culminate into our entry into God's thousand-year Sabbath, then all that we would have to do is figure out when the 7,000-year work week began and count ahead 6,000 years from that point. This would tell us when the last days would end, so it would only be a matter of counting back 1,260 days to figure out when the last days would begin. But as simple as this might seem, there are some problems. The Bible accurately records a very precise and detailed account of the passing of time. Even in the ancient past, we're told such things as how old Adam was when his son Seth was born, as well as how old Seth was when his son was born. It is because of this detailed record-keeping that so many people see the time that we're living in as the last days. In 1975, many of the Jehovah's Witnesses' faith felt that the end of this system was imminent, based on the fact that it was Adam's 6,000th birthday. Jehovah's Witnesses are not the only religion to fall into such a trap. The fact that they would feel this way was based on some very sound reasoning mixed with some very foolish reasoning and a very understandable desire to see the end of Satan's system and the establishment of God's kingdom here on earth. If man was forced out of the Garden of Eden after Adam was created, our seventh millennium day would have to begin sometime after 1975. And because we know for a fact that Seth was born outside of the garden uh, when Adam was 130 years old, then we can also know that at the latest, the end of civilization has to come before 2105. But we can pretty much reduce that time frame by at least 20 years, because Cain and Abel were also born after Adam and Eve left the garden, and the Bible very clearly says that Eve was happy when Seth was born because he would act as a replacement for her murdered son, Abel. It is very unlikely that Abel or his older brother Cain were children when the murder took place. The Bible says that Cain was involved in agriculture and was planning on creating the first city when he killed his brother, not the kind of things that we would associate with a child. Also, according to Genesis 4.1, Adam and Eve's oldest son Cain was conceived outside of the garden, so Cain would not have been born for at least nine months after the first couple entered into what the Bible calls the land of the enemy. Most likely, Abel would not have been born until at least nine months after Cain, and probably not until nine months after Cain had been weaned. Another thing to consider is that the amount of time between Cain and Abel's making their sacrifices and the time that Abel was murdered was most likely three and one half years. The repeating three and one half year cycle that is found throughout the Bible seems to have started with this event. So we can safely say that the end of civilization has got to come sometime between 2014 and 2085. Or can we? There is a big gap that occurred sometime around 700 BC. This is when Jehovah altered the relationship between the earth, moon, and sun. The empire had very precise records prior to this event, but it took about 2300 years before Pope Gregory XIII was able to reestablish a fully functional calendar. Unlike secular history, Bible records are very accurate all the way up until three and one half years after the resurrection of Jesus but this still leaves about a 1,500 year period in which accurate record keeping was not possible. Every prophetic pattern associated with the end of civilization originates either before or during this time of uncertainty. If the date of 2085 is accurate, that would effectively leave me out for a triumphal march into the promised land. I would be 123 years old. For many of the dates associated with this time, we have to trust so-called experts that are untrustworthy. If they're off by as little as 25 years, that could basically put every person alive today in the same situation as me. The reason that the Bible was able to precisely record historic events is based on the fact that the God that altered human perception of time was not confused by the alterations that he himself made. While the humans on earth were busy counting days and weeks in an attempt to figure out what year it was, the Creator was simply counting years. 
The vast majority of humans are not really aware of what makes a year. That is true even today. Humans who had always had a very simple way of tracking years had a very difficult time figuring out what was going on. We're not really able to perceive the Earth's orbit around the Sun, but to the Creator the Earth's orbit would be as easy to track as the hour hand on a clock. Unfortunately for us, once the last book of the Bible was completed, the only accurate record of the passing of time came to an end. The Bible at Amos chapter 8 and verse 11 speaks of this time as a famine, not for food, but for the words of Yahweh. The churches address this scripture in many different ways, depending on their individual agendas. But if you investigate when different books of the Bible were written, you will find, according to popular opinion, that Moses wrote the book of Genesis around 1513 B.C., and that on average a new book was added to the Bible about every 25 years or so. Most people recognize that it has been a very long time since God has had any books added to the Bible, and this, too, is part of a repeating pattern leading to something very important. Thousands of years ago, a man named Abram was asked by the Creator to leave his land and travel to the Promised Land. He agreed, but did not begin his journey to the Promised Land for 40 years. Later, Moses fasted for 40 days while waiting to receive the law. Then, when Israel broke that law, he did it again. The nation of Israel was made to wander the desert for 40 years before being allowed to enter the Promised Land. Later, after being baptized, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness before returning to the Promised Land. Many Bible characters participated in some kind of preparation period measured in some kind of time cycle of 40. This prophetic pattern of 40 time cycles of famine is important for us because we also are about to enter into our promised land. Our famine for the word of the Lord has lasted not for 40 days or 40 years, but instead for 40 jubilees. Even though a jubilee is not a standard measure of time in our modern culture, it is a very important measure of time in the Bible. Forty jubilees equals 1,969 years. We know for a certainty that books of the Bible were being produced at least as late as 36 AD. There are no records of when all of the final books of the Bible were written, but people who study such things say that the last book was written in 99 AD. This fast of 40 jubilees can only mean that we will enter the promised land sometime between 2005, which has already come and gone, and 2067. But once again, we're only able to figure this out because we have experts to tell us when the books of the Bible were written. Unfortunately, most, if not all, of those experts are associated with civilization's mind control system, also known as religion, which means that they are not to be trusted. Just one example of the inaccuracy associated with their dating of the Bible would be the book of Revelation itself, which they date at around 95 to 99 AD. Their reasoning for assigning such a late date is to some extent based on a scripture that indicates that John would be the last apostle to die, and it is speculated that he did all of his writing in the final years of his life from the island of Patmos, where he was imprisoned first problem that we're going to find with this line of reasoning is that there is absolutely nothing to indicate that this book was written by the Apostle John other than the name John. In fact, much of the information given about the identity of the author could not be applied to anybody named John anywhere in the Bible or even in secular history with one exception, John the Baptist. In the very near future, I'll be posting a video entitled The Book of the Angels, explaining in great detail why this is true. There are those that assert that this book could not be written by John the Baptist because of its description of Jesus as the first person resurrected from the dead. John was executed before Jesus' resurrection took place. The only problem with this wicked reasoning is that nearly everything in the book of Revelation takes place after everybody in the Bible was dead. It's, after all, a book of prophecy. The only other books associated with such a late date are the Gospel of John and the three letters attributed to John, and all are given such late dates because it is reasoned that John wrote them after he wrote the book of Revelation, which, as I said, he didn't write. So if we simply throw out these four obviously incorrect, incorrect late dates, 
The youngest book of the Bible would be 2 Timothy, which supposedly was written in 66 AD. But once again, this date is according to uninspired humans. If we determine the date for the end of our 40 Jubilee fast using the remaining possibilities as presented by Christendom's experts, we find that our date for entering our promised land could only come between 2014 and 2035. These figures fall into the same general range as the first figures for the end of our 6,000 year work week. In the beginning, human perception of time was never meant to be governed by artificial means. The Bible says quite bluntly at Genesis chapter 1 and verses 14 through 16 that humans were to perceive the passing of time using the luminaries of the heavens. That means that at one time the sun, the moons, and the planets all function similar to the way that a clock functions. There is more than enough evidence that not just in the Bible but in the archaeological record that confirms that at one time every celestial object in our solar system was clearly visible easily identifiable and moved in a very orderly pattern. So if someone wanted to know what time, day, week, month, or year it was, all that they had to do was to look up and observe how those luminaries were aligned. I have a video posted on my channel that clearly explains all of this entitled of Angels and Men, What Do the 144,000 Represent? Knowing that the solar system no longer functions as it did once means that how we perceive time today would not be the same as it would have been in the past. The Bible very clearly tells us exactly when civilization would come to an end, and yet Jesus said that no man knows. Had the solar system never been altered, everyone would know. Understanding that the timepiece that we call our solar system no longer functions properly has kept me from talking about the age of the earth for a long time. For me, the Bible's chronology indicating that the earth is about 6,000 years old means that the earth's creation was completed about 6,000 years ago when the Creator brought the first woman to the first man. There is nothing to indicate that anything was created after humankind. Even though our English Bibles make it appear as if the men and man and woman were created years apart, in the original languages, it is quite clear that they were both created on the same day. When naming Eve, he did not say, Finally, at long last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and I shall name this one woman because out of man she was taken. But instead simply says, I'll name this last one Ishasha because she was made from Ish. Her flesh and bones are the same as my flesh and bones. In English, an accurate translation of Aish would be alpha male. Ishasha would be alpha female. The Bible did not record the date on which the man and woman were removed from the garden, but we do know that on the day that they decided to follow covenant law, they left off from following natural law. Perception of time in accord with natural law would have followed several cycles of seven as governed by the movement of the celestial bodies placed in the sky by our Creator. This would include the cycle of seven millenniums of the Creator's week. A natural law instead followed the solstice cycle of 400 years. I explained this in great detail in my What Do the 144,000 Represent video. One of the statements that I made in that video was that on the only time that a major event in Bible chronology coincided with a major date on Satan's 400 year calendar would take place at the beginning of the 7th millennium when Jesus and his 144,000 angels would replace Satan and his angels. This event would take place on the first day of Jesus' thousand year rule over the earth. Millennium 6 will end on the same day that Arbe Mahashanah 15 ends. Arbe Mahashanah is the Hebrew phrase meaning the cycle of 400 years. In Greek, this cycle of time is called the Tetrioetos. On the Mayan calendar, it is referred to as the Baktun. Abraham was told about this cycle at Genesis 15:13. Later, Stephen, as he was being executed at Acts chapter 7 and verse 6, reminded us about this cycle. We are still bound by this satanic means of tracking time, as our Gregorian calendar is also based on a repeating 400-year solstice cycle. 
There is one other event that may possibly have taken place at a moment of time where the satanic cycle of 400 years coincided with one of Jehovah's days. At the end of millennium four, Jesus was executed. There is nothing in the Bible to say that 2,000 years after Jesus' death, civilization would come to an end. So for now, this information is only conjecture. But on the day that civilization comes to an end, the Bible says that there would be earthquakes and darkness. On the day that Jesus died, something similar occurred. Also, Jesus died in 33 AD. Two millenniums after that event would be the year 2033. I only mention this because that date easily fits in with both of the other two dates that we already discussed. One problem that I have to mention is that if we are to consider the end of both Millenniums 4, which coincided with the 10th cycle of 400, and the end of Millennium 6, which coincided with the 15th cycle of 400, then we also have to assign something significant to the end of Millennium 2, which would coincide with the 5th cycle of 400. Scripturally, I cannot think of any other event in the Bible accompanied by earthquakes and darkness that would have taken place at that time. Something that seems to be describing a shift of power between Satan's angels and Jesus' angels that seems to fit in chronologically is the account of Jacob's ladder. I personally am not able to figure out any way to assign a definitive date for this event, but it has to have been very close to the end of Millennium II. In the account, Jacob lays his head down on a stone and goes to sleep. While sleeping, he has a dream, and in his dream, he sees something that shakes him up to such an extent that when he awakens, he pours oil on the stone where he had previously been resting his head and declares it for a certainty, this must be the house of God. In English, what Jacob saw is referred to as a ladder. But the actual word is salum. Salum does not appear to be a standard Hebrew word, but instead seems to be made up of other Hebrew words expressing movement and shape. In the scripture itself, this Salum is said to be casting angels down from heaven to the earth, while at the same time casting other angels from the earth up to heaven. A related word, Salum, spelled with an S instead of a C, describes a heap or cone shape. I believe that what Jacob saw in his dream was a cone-shaped vortex opening up between heaven and earth, stripping angels from the earth while at the same time depositing other angels onto the earth, perhaps resembling a tornado or upside down tornado or perhaps even both. If you're more comfortable imagining angels climbing up one side of a ladder while other angels are climbing down the other side, please feel free to retain that image. Only the creator can be said to have a true mastery over time. He has given us the instinctive ability to perceive the passing of that time as well as instinctive ways to keep track of our position within the stream of time. This creation that he put in place is made up of matter and energy, and by using unnatural means we can also keep track of time by observing the so-called universal constants associated with that matter and energy, although it is very difficult for me to understand why anyone would choose to do so. Preachers from every denomination have accumulated worshipers for themselves based on their ability to interpret Bible prophecies related to the last days. I have never seen so much as one of these false gods actually get a single one of these prophecies right. Many of them attempt to make the prophecies about the 1,260 days be about years when in fact that time period is actually about days. In the very near future things will happen that will allow us to know that that time period has begun. On that day, most of the world will still have no idea about the day or the hour, but we will know. But only if we continue to maintain our integrity and continue to have nothing to do with Satan's religions. Most everyone is aware that Jesus associated the last days with such things as earthquakes, famine, pestilence, and war. All of those things are quite obviously taking place right now, and the rulers of Satan's religions are quick to point those things out to us as part of their scare tactics. But there are other things that are about to take place that are far easier to identify because they are unique. Many of those events will take place on day one of the 1,260 day period known as the last days. I'll be posting a video series in the very near future entitled Removing the Seal that will be about the very easy to identify pattern of events that will signal the beginning of our exodus out of Satan's civilization. 
The only thing that you have to do to prepare is be willing to leave. Even though I have presented a lot of evidence that the earth was created in what we would perceive as six standard earth days, the strongest evidence from the Bible that this is a literal six days is based more on the end of the world than the beginning. We are told that the 1,260 day period referred to in the Bible as the last days would be marked by seven lunar eclipses one every 180 days, which means that these eclipses will not occur over millions of years or even for a thousand years, but will begin and end within the time restraints of one solar day. Each eclipse will be marked by a restoration of some part of the original creation. On one of those days, the waters above the expanse will be restored, and on another day, the planets will be restored to their original orbits. But on the final eclipse, the resurrection of the dead will take place. On day six of creation, God only created two people. But as the Apostle Paul said at the final eclipse, all of the dead will be resurrected. That would perhaps be 50 billion people. If the Bible says that God is going to resurrect every person that has ever died on one day, then there's really no reason to believe that it took him millions of years to make just two. Knowing that our ability to track time has been seriously compromised, we can only put so much faith in chronology's ability to reveal when civilization will end. But the Removing the Seal series that I'll be posting soon will not be dependent on any ability to track time. I'll do everything in my power to get that series up as soon as possible, however it may take a year or more, depending on my own ability to manage my time. When you hear this book explained truthfully the fir for the first time in history, I am certain that you will know for a fact that the last days are upon us. If you wish to survive them, then this information is going to be vitally important to you. But if you don't want to survive, don't listen to me.